Hello folks and welcome to today's webinar, State Permitting Pathways for Advancing On-Farm Composting. I'm Linda Bilson Sparolis with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Uh, also joining me is my colleague Megan Matthews who will be helping keep the webinar running smoothly. Say hi Megan. Hey everybody. Awesome. Uh, this webinar will feature the fine folks listed here uh, on the screen. Uh, who will be touring us through different approaches for regulating on-farm composting in Ohio, Iowa, Massachusetts, and Maryland. And I hope that through their presentations or our follow-up Q&A that we'll get a sense of the impact these rules are having on advancing composting on farms. Uh, we'll be introducing our first presenter in just a couple of minutes, but first, uh, for those of you not familiar with our work, ILSR's Composting for Community Initiative is advancing composting to reduce waste uh, regenerate local soils, create community development opportunities, and protect the climate. Uh, we work to catalyze distributed locally based composting options that include home, community, and on-farm systems, and we do this in a number of ways. We convene a national community composter coalition and host national cultivating community composting forums, um, and our next forum is actually coming up in January. It's happening in conjunction with the U.S. Composting Council's annual conference and trade show in Ontario, California. Uh, you can learn more uh, on our website uh, at the link here. I think Megan will be adding it to the chat. Thanks, Megan. Um, we also work one-on-one -on -one with communities through technical assistance and policy support. We produce reports, infographics, and templates for composting sites. We host regular webinars and a podcast, as well as a map. Uh, that shows initiatives around the U.S. and policies and programs that are, that are advancing composting at this scale. You can, you can find all of these resources and more on our website. Uh, if you go to the Composting Initiative main page, you'll see a Composting Resources drop-down menu on the right-hand side of the screen. From there, you can select reports, podcasts, webinars, etc., and find what you need. Uh, we also offer technical training through our Neighborhood Soil Rebuilders Composter Training Program. Um, and we released a self-paced online Community Composting 101 certificate course earlier this year, which covers composting fundamentals and the ins and outs of starting a community-based composting initiative. Enrollment is free for anyone in need, so learn more on our website. Uh, this webinar, which is part of a series, is being brought to you through our involvement with the Million Acre Challenge, of which ILSR is a founding member. Uh, the Million Acre Challenge is a collaborative project that is supporting farmers in implementing healthy soils practices and regenerative agri agriculture on 1 million acres of farmland in Maryland and the Chesapeake region by 2030. Healthy soils practices, including the skillful production and use of compost on farms, have tremendous potential to improve farm resilience and profitability, while also providing critical ecosystem services at a crucial time for our farms and our planet. To learn more about this project, go to millionacrechallenge.org. Thanks, Megan, for adding the link. Um, here's a quick snapshot of the other webinars that we've featured in our on-farm composting and compost use series to date. Uh, last year's webinars, which are listed on the top, um, did a deep dive into technical and business considerations for composting on farms, as well as the myriad benefits of, benef uh, myriad benefits of using high-quality compost for the soil, plants, and the climate. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, we heard from experts from Austria and Spain where farms play a key role in those countries' distributed composting infrastructure. You can access the recording for all of these webinars on our website. So now, let's get to know each other with, a, with some interactive polls, which Megan is going to launch for us. Alrighty, so first question, where are you participating from? Northeastern U.S.? Midwestern U.S., Southern U.S., Western U.S., or outside of U.S.? It's always fun to see who from outside of the U.S. is participating. Give it just another second or two. Alrighty, let's go ahead and close the poll. All right, so as we have in the past, uh, large majority for Northeastern U.S., um, but a good spread of some of the other regions of the U.S. Okay, great. So next question. 
are you currently involved in composting or supporting composting in your work? Select one of the following, yes or no. Alrighty, just another second or two. Okay, let's close this poll up. Vast majority are already involved with composting, so welcome to you and welcome to those 12% that are not yet. Uh, hopefully after today's webinar, you will feel inclined to get involved. Okay, so final question. What best describes your affiliation? I know you all entered this information when you registered, but just so that you can see who's on the line. And it's always fun to see. Um, are you a farmer, composter, government, a uh, big category where we lump a few people together, researcher, nonprofit, or farm service provider, or another business? Awesome. I love the farmers and the government uh, folks are, are neck, neck and neck. All right, just another second and let's close the poll. All right, the government folks have it, uh, but farmers are not far behind. Um, our large category of researcher, nonprofit, and farm service provider is also uh, not too far behind. But welcome to everyone. Um, looking forward to getting into the content of today's webinar. So let's do that. Um, as we hand over controls to our first panelist, a few housekeeping notes. Um, Everyone is in listen-only mode, and again, I don't know if I need to make you the presenter. Uh, I'm going to do that. Um, sorry, folks. Um, Megan, I don't see you in the system. Are you able to take over controls? Uh, yeah, Ange, uh, Angel, if you want to try moving the slides, I think you should have control. Yes, I have control now. Great. Great. Okay. So back Great. to my housekeeping notes. Sorry about that. Um, everyone yeah. is in listen-only mode. Uh, we'll leave time at the end of all of our presentations for questions, but go ahead and answer them, or enter them into your GoToWebinar control panel as they come up. Um, we may have time in between presentations to take one or two. Um, this webinar is being recorded and everyone will be sent a recording within a day uh, of the webinar ending. <clears throat> so now let's introduce our first presenter. Angel Arroyo Rodriguez is an environmental planner and public health practitioner specializing in policies for sustainable management of materials, development of markets for recyclables, and solid waste management planning. He works in the Division of Materials and Waste Management of the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency leading the implementation of the composting and organics recycling program, as well as the infectious waste program. So take us away, Angel. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you to Linda, Megan, and everyone else for inviting me today and give me, giving me this opportunity. Um, I only have 12 minutes, so I'm gonna start um, with my presentation right away. And... If I can move it forward. Megan, can you move it forward just in case? This seems to not be working today. Great, thank you. Um, so I wanted to give you a framework of how composting regulations are um, organized in Ohio. Also the Ohio Revised Code or the state law pretty much referred to composting as a solid waste disposal method and it charges Ohio EPA and the Ohio Department of Agriculture to regulate it. Um, as I said, composting is pretty much viewed as a solid waste disposal. And actually, composting is not listed or appears in the definition of agriculture that we have in the, um, the state law. Um, however, the state law all requires that Ohio EPA consults with the Ohio Department of Development 
to develop quality standards for compost products for use in accordance to agricultural and horticultural practices. So while the state doesn't clearly say that composting is an agricultural activity, the purpose of doing composting, the final intent of that compost that is produced is for agriculture use. Um, in terms of how the state divides um, who's in charge, um, the law actually just puts the Department of Agriculture on the on charge of regulating dead animals and also that would include raw rendering materials. But uh, with the authorities that we have to coordinate our programs, we pretty much have set it up so that Ohio EPA mainly regulates off-farm composting and all on-farm composting goes um, is overseen by the Ohio Department of Agriculture to their Division of Soil and Water Conservation. Now, there are some exceptions to that, and this is what I'm going to discuss next. Um, because the statute doesn't exempt agricultural composting from the regulation from Ohio EPA, um, which that something can initial many years ago is that it doesn't troll because um, farmers did not want it to have to go through the additional uh, regulatory requirements. And also at some point it can cause double regulation with the dead animal composting facilities. So um, back in 2003, we worked, um, made changes to our rules. We work with the Ohio Farm Bureau to find a way that we can incentivize and allow more farmers to compost and use it, um, but also uh, what's fair for all the other off-farm composting facilities that were required to meet the requirement. So what they proposed and we eventually adopted was this exclusion in which um, composting on-farm by agricultural operations from the composting rules, as long as they only um, generate, only compost waste generated at the farming operation, agricultural operation, they composted it on site and they use it, these in the operations. We did allow them to include any yard waste, agricultural plant materials like stover and any other waste that includes manure and bedding. Um, any scraps and other bulking agents as long as they were generated on farm. Um, and also as long as they did not cause any nuisances and surface underwater pollution. Um, now what happens when a facility wants to, um, to accept waste from outside? There are some farmers that they do not produce enough material to produce what they need. Um, well, in that case, they will be regulated under uh, the Ohio uh, EPA composting rules. So also, if they were to produce enough materials that they wanted to sell, then they will have to re uh, register or come under uh, the regulations of our program. Um, we also added this exclusion for off -farm, on farm dead animal composting because it was already mandated to be regulated by ODA. Um, and it actually applies to um, the livestock from farms and also raw rendering materials produce uh, any um, uh, rendered butchers, any, any of the material would also fit under this. Um, the way that the statute is set up, this definitely, this, um, Solution applies as long as the dead animals were owned or generated at the farm and is composting on operations. However, the statute in this case goes a little further in that says that the farmers may distribute either by giving away for free or selling any compost produced from dead animals or raw rendering materials um, as long as they test for the compost quality standards that are in the composting rules that Ohio EPA and ODA developed together. So unlike the previous exemption for anything else that is at a, um, at a farm, if they sell it or give it away, they have to be regulated on the decomposting program in Ohio EPA, but when it comes to dead animals, they don't.
Um, something else that we added in 20, um, 2012, um, and initially was a 500 square feet exclusion, since 2018 is, is 500 square feet, was um, this exclusion that anyone that is composting either yard waste, animal waste, food scraps, bulking agents, additive, any materials that fit in our definition, in an aggregate area no larger than 500 square feet, as I said, on hill hazards and having no surface or groundwater pollution, they do not have to be regulated under the composting regulations. And in this exclusion, the waste can come from any source. It doesn't have to be produced on site. And the compost can be used anywhere. Um, testing is not required, but it's recommended. Now, the main push for this kind of extension was the interest in urban agriculture, community um, uh, gardens. They really needed to have um, sources of, of compost for various reasons, so remediation, um, to grow even with more organic practices. But we, I mean, if you have been at community gardens or urban farms, you know that they do generate enough waste themselves. Uh, and they something need to bring all the waste. So, um, so we have some of these sites in the state. They were not creating any problems. Um, we saw this as a missing opportunity um, by not allowing more people to do something, to do composting at this small scale or fairly small scale. And, um, and we have had these exemptions in 2012, and we have never had any complaints. Okay. So what happens if you do not meet the exemption? You will have to then be regulated as one of our composting facilities. And in Ohio, we divide the facilities by, by classes. Um, I believe that Maryland and other call them types. But we have to call them classes, and each class is allowed certain materials. And you see this table. Um, the most basic one is the class four, and here you can take bulking agents that is like wood chip, shredded cardboard, um, compostable plastic bags, which will come, become the, the bulk. You can take additives that would be like urea, uh, spent coffee grounds, we consider them as additives and not as food waste, and um, and a couple others. Then we have yard waste, agricultural plant material. This could be, um, for some tomato vines from um, hydroponic um, farm. It could be taken to one of these facilities. And then we also allow alternative materials that will be some materials that will be compatible with this, but we don't have it uh, in our rules, maybe something that no one had attempted before. So we have a mechanism to evaluate a potentially approved. Um, now, most of our farms will be under the class three because they are the ones that allow uh, animal waste. Um, some of them, if you, they take in food waste or want to take food waste from also sources, will be a class two. Um, class one is, this is a very, different animal, these are the ones that could take MSW. Right now, we don't have any in the state. We only have had one in 20 years and it closed in 2015. So for the rest of the presentation, anything else, we will only be referring to these three. Now the kind of um, the class of facility, depending on the class and the materials that you take, that kind of determines the level of, or, or the kind of permitting you need. For a class four, you only, they only need a registration. Um, there's no size limit. A class three, only a registration. They do have size limits, and that is because um, they're taking animal waste. Um, so kind of to limit uh, the potential for pathogens, um, we limit on the size. A class two, doesn't have a limit on size, but they do require a license to operate and have a financial assurance, um, cost closure fund. So what is the registration? Um, you see, with registrations, basically, 
are like permits by rule, um, but there's some information that you need to provide. Uh, important is that there's no fee for any of them for any registration. And then it's a form that um, is prescribed and they can be submitted electronically right now. And basically the form asks for information to so the business, owner, operator, the location, which is important, which is what this is what we're gonna use to see you meet the setting criteria. Um, we ask you to calculate the maximum capacity for which the facility was designed. If you're a class two, and um, we want the closure cost estimate because this is what is gonna be used for the financial assurance. And then a statement that you verify that you meet the setting criteria, although we are gonna uh, verify that afterwards. Then they need to submit a plan view drawing of the facility with certain information that is required to evaluate um, for meeting setting criteria and other. But it doesn't have to be signed by a professional engineer. Then they have to submit copies of the letters of intent that they sent. We require that they notify the local zoning authority, fire department, health department, subway management districts of their intent to register a composting facility and the location. And if for some reason there is someone, for example, doesn't meet the stands, um, the setback for an occupied domicile, if they get written consent from the person living there, that they're fine with the facility being located, then they can submit that to us and we can uh, then approve the registration. So the license that class two are required to have are different. Um, they do have a cost. They are renewed annually. And the fee is based on the amounts of weight, uh, maximum daily waste receipt that they can take. Um, at the lower level, a facility could receive 12 tons, up to 12 tons of waste a day. And that includes like food waste, any material, not just, um, not just what is feasible, also what is considered bulk in agent or additive. And the annual cost is um, $300. And then it goes doubling as it goes on. So most of our um, community composters will fall within these, the 12 or 13, most of them is under the 12 at this level. And again, this also can be submitted electronically. Now, something else that we added um, in 2012 um, for is um, for financial assurance. First of all, only the class two requires it. It is based on the estimated closure cost for the max facility maximum capacity. So when you tell what is the capacity, the maximum amount of waste you could ever have the site, we use that to calculate it. However, we know some facilities um, might um, design the facility to have space for a larger amount than what they're gonna use when they're starting. So they have the option to also designate durational capacity, which is, the same numbers but at a different set and then use that capacity to calculate um, the closure cost and for any um, the closure cost for anything that is not um, an alternative material that will have approved individually we calculate the cost at two dollars and fifty cents per we had the opportunity to require that they um, funded a larger amount, but so far we have never had the situation we, we needed to require that for anyone. And once, this is something what I started to mention first, that they, we added, is that once you calculate your financial your closure cost, if the closure cost is $1,500, $500 or less, you do not have to set up the financial assurance at that time. Uh, the reason that we arrive by this number is because um, when you set up financial assurance, there are several mechanisms that the facilities can use. Um, one of them is setting the trust fund. And we found um, that there are some banks and some other play, uh, banking institutions 
that they can charge up to $5,500 to set up um, the, the fund. So certainly it doesn't make sense when you finance your small facility, your financial assurance come to $3,000 that you are gonna pay 5,500 to fund 3,000. So we added this break. And as a fact, we had this break, not only the composting rules, but also we had it for transfer facilities, solid weight transfer facilities. Angel, I'm gonna have to interrupt you uh, if you could wrap it up. Yep. Yeah. Um, my last, um, in Ohio, all compost that is produced have meaning that met the quality standards. And uh, one thing, one um, another kind of exemption that we added, for, especially for farmers, is if the compost is produced, is produced, is used on property owned by the facility owner then the testing is not required, it's optional. So that saves uh, farmers uh, having to test for heavy metals and other um, require, um, other standards. So they typically what they do is just test for the um, agronomic or agricultural requirements that they would normally do if they were land applying uh, manure. Um, and this is all, almost in time. <laughs> Thank you, Angel. Um, we do have some questions for you, but we're going to save them for the end. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, Looking for forward to it. Yes, good. Um, so now while we hand over controls to our second panelist, it's my pleasure to introduce her. Uh, Teresa Steiner is an environmental specialist senior in the solid waste and contaminated sites section of the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. She's been with the Iowa DNR for 23 years and leads permitting for composting facilities and land application. She also works extensively with updating the administrative rules related to solid, solid waste programs, which I think we'll hear a little bit about. So take us away, Teresa. Well, thanks. I am glad to be here today. And, and this is a good, a good process. Uh, you know, not, oops, are you? We see your uh, uh, first slide and now the second. Oh, okay. It, it, okay. Oops, and then it went back? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, maybe I just stay for a second. So th thanks. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, first thing I wanted to do is just kind of give you an overview of who regulates what. Um, not, can, I might have to have you advance my slides. There's something not working. Let's see. Sure. We We can definitely do that. Yep, just let me know when you're ready to go to the next slide. Okay. Yeah, okay. if you could go to the next one. There we go. Okay. So first, I just want to give you like the big picture of who regulates what, um, especially when it comes to on-farm composting, there's several entities that are involved. So um, I am in the solid waste section, and I we have what's called um, Iowa Administrative Code Chapter 105 Organic Materials Composting Facilities that we uh, implement. And that chapter is deals with the, the permits and the facilities that are producing compost. Um, but then also in the DNR, we have the animal feeding operations section, and they would cover anything that's under, that's being composted that's coming from an animal feeding operations. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later. But um, then also there's the uh, sale and distribution of, of the compost that falls under the Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship, because I only deal with it on the wayside once it becomes a product. I don't have any authority over it anymore. And so that moves over to uh, Department of Agriculture. Um, if you, oops, could you, could you um, advance for me? Are you, you're able to see me yet, right? My, my picture is going off and on. Anyways, um, yeah. so I, everything I say here today is got a little asterisk by it, subject to change, because uh, we are actually in the midst of revising chapter 105. Um, uh, so we had a multi-stakeholder work group that has met three times, um, and now I am taking all the, the great ideas and discussion that we had from those, those work groups and are attempting to craft a revised Chapter 105 rule. Um, I'm hoping to have that draft done by mid-January to get back out to our stakeholder work group, um, and they'll take another crack at it, and then um, 
even it will go out more widely um, to uh, anyone who wants to comment on it or give us feedback on it. Um, our goal is to have a notice of independent action drafted by July that would go to our governor's office for approval for us to move forward. Um, once we get that approval, we would start our formal rulemaking process, which takes um, a good seven to eight months, and that's assuming that there's no hiccups or delays. Um, so um, an effective date would be sometime in 2024. So it's it's a bit of a long process, but um, that's the way it is. Um, also, interestingly, um, Department of Agriculture was one of our stakeholders that we had involved in our group, and um, and it became apparent in the discussions that some of the the roadblocks to really um, getting the composting uh, uh, moving in Iowa is uh, their regulations related to um, soil conditioners. Um, and so they are actually looking at making changes as well. Now their rules are under um, Iowa Code Chapter 200. Um, so where ours is an administrative rule that we can do administratively, um, theirs is code which takes a legislative action. So they are actually hoping to have a proposal for um, this upcoming um, legislative session that starts in January. So um, fingers crossed that they're able to do it that quickly and that they're able to get that done because that would be a big, a big help. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Um, so why are we revising the, these rules? So first off, all uh, state agencies in Iowa are required to go through their administrative rules every so often to look for things that are outdated or ineffective or redundant, um, things that are inconsistent with the statute, um, and to, to update and revise those rules. Um, so this was a chapter that was identified through that process. Um, also, the, the gist of this rule was um, implement, uh, started about 20 years ago. So um, certainly there has been changes in technology since then and definitely changes in the, the industry um, and as well as growth in the industry. Um, I, I really feel like we are at the cusp of, of um, composting really taking off in Iowa, and we want to have these uh, administrative rules that facilitate facilitate um, that and are not a hindrance. Um, so it's, it's always the balance with administrative rules of, of, of uh, you know, wanting to protect the environment, but at the same time, we don't want to hinder composting uh, either. Um, also, there's increased interest in keeping organic materials out of the landfill. Food waste is one of the, the big things that's uh, components that goes into Iowa landfills. And it's, you know, it's not just a space issue, it's also a greenhouse gas issue. Um, so we want to see it, try and keep those out. Um, also, we, we were seeing an increased number of variances being issued to this rule. And uh, uh, that, that's always an indicator that the rule <laughs> needs to be fixed. Um, as I go through this presentation, I'll, I'll talk about the different levels of regulations that we have, and it's very specific what falls under these different levels. And if you if you don't fall under these specific categories, then you need to have the full permit. And so there was an inequity in how similar materials were being regulated, and so we want to um, to fix those gaps, basically. Um, and then lastly, the requests to the stakeholders. They've been been asking us for several years to revise this chapter, and so it's, it's high time we get it done. If you could, in the next slide, please. Uh, so like I said, there's several levels of regulations. The first is exempt, and that means you're not re not regulated under Chapter 105. And this, this is all Chapter 105, I should say. Um, so if you're exempt, you're not subject to any of the regulations in Chapter 105. And I'll, um, we'll talk about that more in a second. Um, the second level is permit by rule, and that can be a confusing term sometimes to people. And all that means is as long as you're following um, some specific rules in the chapter, you are not required to get an actual individual permit. So there are some general rules that for all facilities, so that includes like your setback distances and uh, an all-weather pad and um, you know, managing your runoff and your leachate and you know, just general things like that. Um, and then there's also some specific rules for the specific type of facility that's under the permit by rule. So like uh, animal mortality composting has some specific rules just for animal mortality composting that you would need to follow. So then if you don't fall under any of these specific uh, permit by rule things, or if you can't meet the permit by rule uh, requirements, then you would be required to get a full individual permit. 
Um, and so that's where you're actually working with a, an engineer to design your facility. There's, you have to submit operations plans. There's um, training requirements for the operator, um, annual um, reporting requirements as far as the tonnage is coming in and going out. Um, so that's definitely a, a, a bigger lift than, than the permit by rule. Um, the, the one advantage to having a permit is uh, that we can put in specific requirements that are specific for your permit or for your facility. So if you have some unusual circumstances or a unusual feedstock or something, we can make accommodations for that in, in the permit, um, whereas we can't do that in the, the permit by rule. If you can go to the next slide. So first off, uh, for on-farm composting, we have agricultural waste. So this would include uh, manure, crop residue, bedding, um, vegetative bright products from farm processing. Um, and, and I want to uh, clarify that that means like the, on the farm processing. So we're not including, um, you know, brewer's grains from an ethanol plant or something like that. That would be an industrial waste, but in, things, byproducts that are occurring on the farm. Um, and it specifically does not include dead animals either. So if you're composting agricultural waste and it's not mixed with, with any other organic materials to compost, just, just agricultural waste and clean wood waste as, as a bulking agent, um, that is fully exempt from our, our chapter 105, the composting regulations. Um, none of it applies to you. However, if this agricultural waste is coming from an, an animal feeding operation, you are still subject to chapter 65, the animal feeding operation requirements. Um, and as the people in the field office tell me, uh, once manure, always manure. And so if you have a windrow of manure and bedding um, or whatever agricultural material that you're, you're composting, um, that is treated exactly the same as if you have just a stagnant pile of manure just sitting there. Um, it's, it's still treated just as a manure stockpile. Um, and then once that uh, composting is finished, um, if you are selling it, as a, selling it or even giving it away, uh, it has to be registered as a soil conditioner under the Department of Agriculture and follow those regulations. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the second thing that we see primarily on farms is the farm animal mortalities. And this falls under our uh, permit by rule um, uh, under certain circumstances. So if you are the owner of at least one of the sites where the animals are being generated, um, you can compost them and take in uh, animals, uh, mortalities from your neighboring farms. Um, so you just have to be own the, site, the owner of at least one of the sites. Um, and then this is strictly uh, the animal mortalities, farm animal mortalities uh, with clean wood waste. It specifically excludes including manure um, with that. Now, <laughs> why is that? I don't know. Why they, why they put that in the rule. That's one of the things we're, we're probably gonna tweak as we update it, because if you're composting animals, you know that you want some manure in there to kind of get things going. Um, so I'm, I expect that that will be changing. But as for right now, if you're composting manure with dead animals, um, it would require a permit. Um, also, this is only farm animals. It does not include um, uh, roadkill. It doesn't include um, like, like fish kills or like or lake is being renovated and they have to kill off the fish or something like that. Those would all have to go to a permitted facility uh, to compost legally. Um, and then I did as this kind of an aside one to mention um, the highly pathogenic avian influenza. If you're familiar with that, um, if if one animal in a in a at a farm break uh, is found positive for HPAI, the whole farm is um, is euthanized. And these farm animal mortality rules are really more for the day-to-day the -day mortalities. Um, you can uh, compost if you have like an electrical outage or something like that, where you have a lot at one time, you can do it under these permit by rules. Um, but as far as when it's a, like an HPAI type situation, in those cases, Department of Agriculture is the lead agency on that because they have very specific rules as far as um, making sure that the temperature uh, in the compost reaches a certain um, temperature for a no certain number of days and, and all of that to ensure that the, um, that the virus is inactivated and the virus is not being spread around. So um, like, uh, unfortunately we have had uh, three farms break um, just in the last couple of weeks. So it's very much on our minds here in Iowa. Um, permit requirements are in those cases are waived. So they will typically, uh, 
uh, compost all the 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 birds the the litter or whatever manure they have um, eggs feed anything that needs to be composted can all be composted together without worrying about getting a permit we're not going to worry about paperwork in a time like that um, on farm composting is in fact the preferred method of disposal um, we we don't want hauling these these chickens around um, and spreading the the disease further. Teresa, I'm sorry oh. to interrupt. Uh, oh. If if you could wrap up in the next minute or two. Sure, sure. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Um, you know what? We can just skip this because this really isn't all that applicable to our farm. So the one thing I did want to make sure you uh, are aware of: if you are selling or even giving away your compost. Um, you need to register as a soil condition with the Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship. Um, uh, so even if you're not selling it, if you're just giving it away, they still consider that distribution and so it has to be registered. Um, there's a number of requirements with that I didn't I didn't list here because that's it's not my deal, so I don't know a lot about it. But um, one thing that came up in our stakeholder meetings was that it requires secondary containment, um, which that is a big sticking, uh, a big, a big roadblock for um, really uh, promoting compost uh, composting um, and so that that's what they're looking at potentially changing um, in their regulations uh, if you can go to the next slide I think that's about it oh um, yeah just wanted to say that the interest in compost is, has really been increasing um, across the state both generally and uh, on farm um, especially the the animal mortalities the rendering has become less and less available um, and so there's more interest in that so um, if you can go to the next slide um, please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions or uh, things that aren't answered in this um, in this uh, webinar. Also, if you would like to see the the draft rules when we make them publicly available, just drop me an email and I will be happy to put you on my list. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Teresa. And sorry, I gave you guys a, a big task to try to cover a lot of ground in a short period of time. So. Um, thank you. We're going to go ahead and save uh, any questions for the end. So now we're going to hand things over to our next panelist, um, Sean. Um, Sean Bowen is an environmental analyst in the Division of Agricultural Conservation and Technical Assistance at Massachusetts, Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. Um, he joined the department in 2008 as an aquaculture specialist. But, been, but has been working with MDAR's agricultural composting program since 2010 and has overseen the program since 2015. So Sean, take us away. Thank you so much, Linda and Megan. I, uh, I appreciate you guys having me here to uh, discuss the MDAR agricultural composting program. Um, I can work it, good. Um, so again, my name is Sean Bowen, and uh, among my other duties at uh, Mass Department of Agricultural Resources, I'm Agricultural Composting Coordinator. Um, best job in the world. <laughs> I actually work in the field, uh, so I go farm to farm, and uh, it's it's a pretty good thing. MDAR encourages farms to compost. Um, compost can be fairly expensive to buy, so we encourage crop farms who want to improve their soil to compost on site, make their own compost so they can apply it. And it improves soil tilt water holding capacity, which as we saw with the drought this past summer is uh, increasingly important um, and it adds nutrients and micronutrients. And we encourage animal farms to compost uh, manure as part of nutrient management. Um, finished compost is more stable than manure Finished compost really has no odors, there's less leaching, it's lighter, and it's easier to handle and spread. Um, in Massachusetts, primary regulatory authority lies with Mass Department of Environmental Protection under their solid waste regulations. Our agricultural composting program uh, comes from essentially a, a, a paragraph or two within those solid waste regulations, which, uh, allows farms to register with our department. It's actually more of an application process. It's not simply a registration. Um, and farms who are registered with MDAR uh, have a conditional exemption from Mass DEP. Uh, farms only need to register if they are accepting material from offsite 
for the purpose of composting. Um, and for the purpose of composting, that phrase is pretty important because if somebody were receiving wood chips as bedding material first, um, and then they were composting manure and bedded material, they wouldn't need to be registered. Um, but if they were just bringing wood chips on or leaves, they would need to be registered. Um, so um, farms have been have been composting uh, for thousands of years, uh, and at MDOT we really hope that they can continue. And it's our job to help that along and keep it under control. Um, Often a farm can register either with the Department of Agricultural Resources or MassDEP. Uh, in 2014, MassDEP put in some uh, food waste, um, a, a food waste ban to the landfills, and concurrently they revamped their regulations, making it easier to to uh, to get a permit under them. Uh, prior to 2014, they had to apply for site assignment which was a very onerous um, process. Um, so usually a farm can, can apply with either Mass DEP or MDOT. Um, however, if they're receiving material for composting from offsite and they're not registered with MDOT, then default regulatory authority lies with DEP. Um, the DEP general permit, it's an online registration. It's no cost. Uh, MDOT, our registration costs two hundred fifty dollars initially and two hundred dollars annually to renew. We have uh, last count forty five registered agricultural composters uh, from west to east, from Berkshire County to Barnstable County, including on Martha's Vineyard. We have none on Nantucket, although for the president going on Nantucket uh, last week, perhaps we should find some high high profile farms on Nantucket. Uh, our mission at MDAR is to support farms, uh, to, to help them to be e economically efficient and environmentally sustainable. Uh, and so when we receive an application for an agricultural composter, the first thing we have to do is make sure that it's a, an actual farm. Uh, so agriculture has to be the predominant use of the, of the, of the site uh, and composting must not prevent the ability of that farm to maintain as an agricultural unit. Uh, composting can't get bigger than agriculture. Um, and we also require that farms um, either have 25% of the inputs uh, from the farm into the composting or that 25% of the finished compost is applied to the farm in an agricultural manner. Um, so sometimes it's difficult to, to ascertain whether uh, uh, a facility is engaged in agricultural composting or solid waste management. When you look at these pictures, some of them uh, look like they're clearly just solid waste, but um, it, it's, as I had referred to earlier, it's, it's dependent upon the inputs and the final use. Um, so down the right-hand side, we have clam bellies being composted with leaves um, and, and yard waste. Um, that actually is an agricultural composter. The, 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 the grass up top, I believe, was not. Um, so sometimes it's difficult to determine if it's solid waste or agricultural composting. Our job is to protect, is, is, to, is to assist farms uh, to the extent that it can facilitate solid waste management. That's good, um, but our job is to, is to uh, facilitate um, agriculture. Um, one of the things that I found um, prior to joining the department and, and since I've joined is that farms can be seen by some people as a place for problems to go. Um, so whether those are stumps or old equipment, um, I remember when I was a kid, we had a dog that went around biting people and we came home from school one time and we said, mom, where's Gilligan? And she said, oh, Gilligan is on a farm now. Uh, we sent it to a farm, there's plenty of room to run and um, so a farm can be seen as a place where problems go. And we, we really try to uh, make sure that doesn't happen. Um, so when we receive an application for agricultural composting, we need to look at their proposed activities 
in in combination and in contrast with their the farm resources and resources can take uh many shapes uh, time and equipment are two big things as our knowledge um, and a carbon source um, i tell folks if you don't have any carbon on site you have no business taking nitrogen um, so we need to make sure that um, farms have the time and the knowledge and the equipment and the access to the materials that they need uh, to adequately compost that material properly um, without causing a nuisance. So when a farm registers with MDAR, we, it, they're granted a conditional exemption from Mass DEP's regulation. Um, it's not a, it's not a license to pollute. I don't buy that I'm a farm. I can do whatever I want, <laughs> especially when it comes to composting. Um, so MDAR registered composters have to comply with our regulations. Uh, we we, we um, uh, I have a slide coming up on those. Um, in 2020, we in implemented new regulations, um, and we have a guide to agricultural composting online. Um, they have to incorporate best management practices and uh, prevent uh, pollutants to water, air, and not create a public nuisance. As Linda was saying, uh, uh, our program, my job is located within the Division of Agricultural Conservation and Technical Assistance, and I try to regulate by technical assistance. Um, I, I spend a lot of the time in the field, as I was saying, conducting site visits randomly, um, often by request to the farm, unfortunately, often by complaints as well, as a result of complaints, either from neighbors or the Board of Health. Um, I can help uh, prior to start up with site selection, layout and methods, recipe development, troubleshooting can be a big thing, um, and offer general guidance to the composters. Um, we don't have a lot of punishment or, or uh, punitive uh, measures that we can take for non-compliant composters. Uh, essentially, the only leverage that we have is to cut ties with them and revoke a registration, in which case, if the farm chooses to continue composting, they'll have to do so under the mass under mass DEP regulation. We do have a carrot or two. Um, one of which is was started about five years ago. We have the Agricultural Composting Improvement Program, a grant program, uh, where we fund. It's a cost sharing, 75% up to $75,000 to farms to fund equipment and projects which will facilitate composting, make it more environmentally friendly, and facilitate the use of compost on site. So we fund things such as compost spreaders, screeners, windrow turners, mixers, windrow covers. Um, projects to improve compost pads. We fund. Uh, we funded several uh, improved technology systems, static aerated. Last year, we had a great in vessel composter for a mushroom farm. Um, it's been a fairly popular program. We don't have a ton of funding for it, uh, but uh, we're hoping that that will continue. Uh, so, as I said, February 2020, uh, just before the COVID boat sailed off the end of the world, we implemented new regulations. Um, horrible timing on our part, um, but uh, those, uh, among other things, um, those regulations implemented some, it codified some restrictions, uh, volume restrictions of 5,000 cubic yards per acre of compost site, with a total uh, volume of, of pre-processed, in-process, and finished compost of 15,000 cubic yards. Um, we, we tied the size of the compost site to the size of the commercial production area of the farm itself uh, can be no bigger than 10% of it. So if you have 50 acres in production, you can have a five acre compost site with a maximum of 10 acres, regardless of the size of your farm. And we codified some setbacks uh, of the compost site to minimum 250 feet from a well and 100 feet from a property line. Uh, those are minimums, they're not, they're not uh, appropriate in all circumstances, depending on methods and uh, compostable materials. Uh, there are several other items that were um, in, the, in the regulations. One of those was uh, to develop a written odor management plan, which we take a holistic approach to the odor management plan. Uh, it's more about process control, demonstrating that and, and knowing what to do, how to monitor and what to do if process uh, gets out of control. Uh, and the mandatory training, uh, which 
through COVID went on hold and we have yet to bring that back up. I need to uh, get on the ball and get, get doing that though. Um, and that should about do it. There's my contact information. I'm happy to answer any questions. And if you don't want to answer, ask a question, feel free to reach out to me by phone or email. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, and uh, so, yes, yeah, saving questions for the end. We're handing off to our final panelist. Tarek Masood is a senior regulatory and compliance engineer with the Maryland Department of the Environment's Waste Diversion Division and Land and Materials Administration. Tarek has worked with MDE for over 30 years and has been involved with implementing MDE's composting regulations since 2016. He is responsible for reviewing composting facility permit applications, approving county solid waste plans, mm -hmm. and managing data collection from facilities and the counties. So there you go, Tariq, take us away. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hello everyone, happy holidays. So state of Maryland, Maryland adopted its composting regulations back in 2015. And the link to the regulation is available at this so www.mde.maryland.gov backslash composting. Uh, we have very exciting information on this um, page. Uh, for example, the current status of the recently passed legislations on organics, diversion, composting, and recycling. Also, we have the permit applications available uh, for the general permit and individual permit, which we offer to the composting facilities. And also we have a listing of uh, permitted composting facilities. So next page, next slides. Okay, how am I gonna move that though, Linda? Um, are, you, are you able to progress your slides or would you like Megan to? Yeah, let's see. Uh, next slide, right. Uh, can I move it though? Um, I think we were using our arrows to do that. Uh, the top one, the red one? Oh, the uh, bottom. Uh, on your okay, keypad. Oh, okay, I see. There you go. Okay. Uh, So, uh, well, actually we missed one slide uh, about the roles and responsibilities. So let me just go over that. Um, I cannot see that though. I'm looking at basic definition. Anyway, roles and responsibilities. So basically two programs at Department of the Environment are responsible for uh, implementing the composting regulation. The first one is resource management program, which is a program I work actually. And the second one is a solid waste program. Uh, resource management program, we issue uh, review composting facility permit applications and uh, ensure that all the new legislations which are uh, basically passed uh, for the same reason of composting, recycling, or, or, or organic uh, diversion stuff. So we work on those and stuff. So solid waste program responsibility is to inspect compliance enforcement related activities. And if somebody complain about a composting facility, whether it's permitted or non-permitted, then somebody from solid waste program is gonna go out and inspect the site and figure out the matter. Uh, so next slide should be basic definitions. So composting regulations offer two kinds of facilities. First one is a tier one facility. Uh, second one is tier two. So basically tier one is the facility that uses type one feedstock, which is yard waste. Tier two type facility means that uh, facility that uses type, type two uh, feedstock. Uh, I cannot move, seems like, oh, okay. Here we go. Okay. So uh, the so these are the type two feedstock which we approve under the regulations for the facilities. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with all. So I don't think so. I'm gonna go in that detail though. Next. So this is a basic permitting exemptions for entire Maryland. Uh, it doesn't matter where you're located. Uh, if you are in farmland or uh, any uh, commercial land or uh, you are actually composting in backyard on your house or you are at uh, community type operations. So as long as you, you're using uh, up to 5,000 square feet of area for in support of composting and your uh, feedstock storage piles would not go above nine feet and your product, um, uh, basically storage piles 
uh, 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 the active composting curing and, and, and the product storage path would not go 12 feet, then you would not need state permit until you are, uh, as long as you're meeting the general restriction and provision act requirements discussed in regulation number, uh, basically four, chapter four of the regulations. So in support of composting has a very distinct definition under the regulation. So basically your entire operation has to fit within this 5,000 square foot of area, for example, feedstock storage to active composting, to curing, screening, and product storage and equipment storage, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, actually, um, so if you are at the landfill, uh, if your facility is at landfill and you are using up to 5,000 square foot area, you would not need the state permit because your permit probably would be, your operation would be covered under the ref disposal permit. Also, if you are located at the residen residential property, you have to make sure that if you are using 5,000 square feet of exemption, um, basically you will be only allowed to uh, use the feedstock, which is generated at your site. And also you're gonna use all the product back to your site for that purposes. You will not able to sell the material and stuff like that. Um, so these are the permit, permitting exemptions specifically applicable to the farming operation. These are the additional uh, permitting exemptions. So basically a farmer can compost all the material that is generated on his farm and he is allowed to bring more material from another farm which he controls and operates. And as long as he use all the product at his site, then he would not need a state permit. Second exemption is that which is the same 5,000 ones. I'm gonna go back to the next one. So the next one will be the 40,000 square feet. So farmer can have up, have up to 40,000 square feet site at the site, and he will be allowed to bring um, yard waste and manure from the outside sources and uh, any other organic material which he wants to compost, which has to be generated at this farm. So basically he can bring yard waste and manure from outside the sources and he can have 40,000 square feet of location at his farmland. And uh, as long as he's meeting the general restrictions and provision act requirement, which as I mentioned earlier, discussed in chapter four of the regulations. And as long as the farmer has a nutrient management plan on site and also if he possesses a soil conservation and water quality plan or agricultural waste management system plan. So we would not need a state permit for those reasons. This is the same as what I discussed earlier. So general restrictions and um, spe specifically prohibited acts. So basically it's generally says behave. So it's basically self checks, self compliance kind of situation that you can have up to 5,000 square foot of area or you can have a 40,000 square foot of area at the farmland and you just, you don't, you just need to uh, basically keep your site nice and clean, not to create any nuisance, um, rodent infestation. So basically just uh, keep the site clean and nice. So this way we don't have to come out and inspect and nobody's going to complain about your property. So this way we're not going to open any can of worms and stuff like that. So this is the status of the active composting facilities in the state of Maryland at this time. Uh, we have 20 permitted facilities in Maryland, 14 are tier one type and six are tier two. So 14 again tier one are the one they're using yard waste as a feedstock. Six are the one they're using other materials, including uh, food scraps, uh, uh, chicken litter, manure, um, animal bedding, hay, currant seeds, et cetera, et cetera. Four facilities are built on active landfill sites and their operation has been modified into a uh, landfill refuse disposal permit system. One facility is tier two, which is built on a farmland. This is very significant. Entire Maryland, that's the only facility which is on a farmland and permitted. So entire Maryland farmers are pretty much exempted at this time because they are probably uh, operating and, uh, uh, and they are exempt under the regulation. So we don't have to worry about that. 15 facilities are tier one and tier two are operating under general composting facility permit. So this, this is basically a general composting facility concept is that the this general permit has uh, the best possible permit conditions you can generate from the regulations to make sure that it will protect the public health and environment. 
so a uh, facility has to be designed in a manner so they can meet all the conditions of general permit that's the idea here right so individual composting facility permit is a type uh, where if you cannot meet the general permit conditions and also the regulatory requirements especially their design requirements then you will be a candidate for the individual permit which is really a problematic process for individual permit i mean it's uh, you're going to open a whole lot of can of worms the process involved the uh, you know, uh, involving other state agencies, federal government, etc., etc. So you don't want to go that route. You have to comply with the general permit. That's the idea. Anyway, so uh, so one facility in Maryland is currently an individual composting facility, right? Um, 2021 feedstock received and compost produce status. So that's what happened in 2021. We get the data from these permitted facilities every year by January 31st. So that's what they told us. Um, pretty much all 20 facilities are operating. And that's what we have. Uh, yard trimmings, 262, 541 ton. That's pretty good number. Uh, food scraps, 23109 tons, which is kind of low number. We are expecting these numbers to grow up in future. Wood chips, 12987. Uh, it's, they use probably for the create a base uh, for the tier one uh, food scrap type facility, tier two type facilities. Poultry waste, 12,849 tons, hay straw, 10,260. Anyway, so the total compost produced is 227,423 tons, which is a uh, compared to uh, a higher number compared to what the feeding is. And the reason is that these composters, they're sitting on the material from the last year, and that's what they produce. So this year, they produce 227,423 tons. And I have no idea where they took the material to because they were uh, reporting requirement does not require them to tell us what did they do with the uh, compost. Um, 2021 feedstock received and compost produced at the farmlands. So again, I mentioned we uh, only one facility is on a farmland, Twin Maple facility. This facility is located in Caroline County. Uh, nice operation, though it's not a traditional uh, windrow type operation. It's more like a, it's, it's an enclosed in vessel operation and uh, in 2021 uh, uh, let me see they received what 16,329 tons of feedstock and produced 15,960 tons of compost which is not bad and that's the only one we have right now anyway so no data available from any non-permitted composting operation Maryland farmlands so assumption is that all the farmers are currently composting at their farms and are exempting under the composting regulations. And uh, so we're not gonna go out and check anyone uh, unless somebody complain about it, um, then we can go and see what's going on. We do get complaints sometime, not necessarily at the farmland because usually farmlands are away from the communities and nobody's gonna know what's going on. So we're not gonna uh, get a whole lot of complaints from the farmland, but usually we get complaints about the, from the uh, uh, backyard composting operations or, community-based kind of operations and natural wood waste composting, or natural wood waste um, uh, recycling facilities. Sometimes they compost and then they try to figure out if they are composting, then what kind of permit they need, stuff like that. So um, that's it. So this is my information. If a farmer, I, I'm sure the number of um, uh, or nice farmers are listening to this conversation. So if, if you guys think that uh, you are not exempted under the regulation give me a call at this number so we can talk about the permitting process and i can give you guys a whole lot of information about it and we can go from that point and that's it thank you very much great thank you Tarek. um so at this point we're going to move on to question and answer um so if all of our panelists could turn on their videos um i'm gonna start us off with a general question um, we did have a few specific questions um, but let's start with something that everybody can participate in um, I think Derek touched on this with some of his numbers um, but um, we're wondering the gauging the impact of the regulations that you all have um, presented on um, for anybody that can answer this, how many farmers are composting on farm do you know of in your state? We could do a round maybe starting with Unhel and going to Teresa, going to the order. Um, since, well, the farmers that meet the exemption, uh, we really don't know 
because that means that we don't we don't track it. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that there are some doing it. However, we do have um, some farmers that are registered as class two and class threes because they want to um, bring material from outside sources to complement. And um, and we have uh, four fairly large facilities. Big, um, these farmers pretty much um, use at least 90% of all, if not all of the composite produce in their fields. And I know some, one of them um, recently is using everything and they estimate they want to double their capacity because they do not produce enough for their needs. Um, of the others that we have class three, um, some are farmers or small farmers that um, want to compost themselves. But most of them are facilities that are close to farms uh, and the farmers, or it could be also um, um, horse barns and other you know, farms that they do, do not want to do the composting themselves, so they rather chip it. To them. But it's increasing, the interest in the state is increasing greatly. And we're really trying to do, figure out how to do more um, um, incentives for farmers to use, especially in the area surrounding the Lake Erie. That's muted, thank you. Um, and I guess an add on for everyone, do you think that the rules that you have in place have, have made it easier uh, for farmers to compost? Um, I think so. Um, the way the rules are, you know, usually farmers call that they, because they want to compost that they think this is going to be this very long convoluted process. And we said it's a pre-registration. The most difficult part is you assembling a plan B drawing. You can use um, free sources that are there. Sometimes we help, but in terms of information, is a uh, is simple. Our regulations are mostly a performance standard, so it's you just need to meet this goal. How you meet it, up to you to what you can afford to what you have available and what and your needs. Great, thank you, Angel and Teresa. So the questions are. How, do you know how many farms are composting? I know with the exemptions, it gets harder to track, but then do you think that the rules you have in place or are uh, changing to, in your case, um, are, is it making it easier for farmers to compost? Yeah, so um, since the agricultural waste is fully exempt, um, I don't I don't know. And then with the animal mortalities, even though it's permit by rule, that one doesn't require uh, registration or reporting. So I don't have any any idea on that one either. Um, I do have one farmer that is fully permitted um, because he's taking biosolids and, and food waste. Um, the one, the one of the things I didn't um, get into was there is a permit by rule for places that want to um, take food waste along with to, to kind of, if you want to compost food waste or yard waste along with your agricultural waste. Um, it's limited. The the permit by rule is limited to two tons per week. Now two tons per week of uh, food waste does not go very far and and, and with the yard waste so um that is one thing that our um our work group really wanted to um increase that pretty significantly so i think that that's um will be um significantly up so that so that like a farmer like a local farmer could maybe take um stuff from like a college or something or a school and stuff like that um so i i i do think that will be something that's that's coming, but um, as for right now, I can't really say because it's it's all exempt or, or permit by rule as far as how many there are. Sure, that is, I suppose, the downside or a potential downside of the exemptions. Um, Sean, what about you in Massachusetts? You, so, yeah, go ahead. So we have we have forty five registered MDAR agricultural composters. Um, last I heard, I think the number of seven thousand farms sticks out. Many of those are tiny, but um but um i'd say almost every farm has some type of composting on it um uh, many farms are either composting field culls or animal manure or something like that um but, so it would be really hard to quantify um 
as far as the regulations making it easier or more difficult, I don't think regulations ever make it easier, do they? Uh, <laughs> I, th I think regulations always make things more difficult. My job in the division of, of technical assistance is to kind of usher that along and facilitate and teach the farms how to deal with that. So um, I guess I don't know if it makes it easier or harder, or uh, I, I would suspect that any regulations are going to make things a little more difficult and not easier, but hopefully it's effective at um, mitigating environmental uh, degradation. That's a, <clears throat> that's a fair point. I think in some cases where there isn't explicit language um, and there's a gray area, sometimes people get lost. So I think in that case, a regulatory pathway so that people know what they're doing, what they're allowed to do, what they're not, I think could be considered making it easier for people so they don't get stuck in a limbo. You're absolutely right. And we, ha and we have two predominant pathways in Massachusetts with the DEP, which is fairly simple, and DAR, which isn't that isn't that difficult either. Great. Okay. Thank you, Sean. And Tarek, I don't know if you have anything to add. Um, the number of firms, yeah. I think you already, you already covered that and the yeah. amounts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think in Maryland, uh, our regulations are very farmer and business friendly. Uh, we have a whole lot of exemptions for farmers and also, I mean, uh, for the commercial uh, businesses. Uh, so uh, that's the reason why we only have one permitted sites on farmland. And uh, I'm sure a lot of farmers are operating. And actually, I know a couple of farmers are operating, but we did inspect them. And we, it turns out to be that they are within the limits of the exemption. So there's no big deal. But um, overall, um, I think it's um, it's good if you, if you don't need a permit and you're still operating and doing good business. That's a good deal, actually. You know, right? So you don't have to unnecessarily go and um, make people get the permits. So. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to add something. Mm -hmm. else. Um, to certain regulations, what we have seen in some cases is that some farms um, that would could meet are exemptions, they want to be regulated. And the reason is to demonstrate to neighbors um, that they are um, subjected to some standards. Um, in some areas, and that probably happens in all states, something these farmers been there, they want to start doing composting and neighbors start complaining about or opposing their composting activities. And the fact that they can point out, hey, but we are going to be regulated by the high EPA. We have to follow these operational standards. This is how we can assure you we're not going to cause problems. And actually, high EPA is going to be here a couple of times a year, so the health department. So they can assure you. And we certainly have to come and explain, um, advocate on behalf of the farmer, saying, yeah, what they're doing is fine. And anyway, they have to do these things. And we will check if there's any complaints. You can call us. We can verify. And that's something that helps. The, you know, it sounds con contrary to what people think. But in this case, having a regulation really helped them do this because they have a way to defend themselves and a way to legitimize what they're doing. Great. Thank you. That's a great addition, Angel. Um, and I will be curious if you all have questions for each other um, on the panel or not. But uh, at this point, a question that I had and somebody else um, in the audience had a similar question. I guess, do you view farms um, as, like on-farm composting, do you view that as a tool of helping to fight or reduce food waste in your states? And I think I hear, heard some of you touch on that. Um, but then this person is asking about reducing the need or demand for spreading sludge or biosolids on farmland. So by increasing on-farm composting, does that have an impact on reducing food waste going to disposal in your minds? Like, is that a scalable solution? Um, and then does it reduce the need or demand for sludge and biosolids? Let's do the same order. Uh, Angel, if you have a thought on that. Uh, I think I, I believe. Can... Yeah, oh, go, ahead. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. We do have some other, we have some farmers that they actually take food waste and have a large operation and they are big players in 
diverting food scraps, and food waste to their facilities, they compost that they use on site. Um, some of them are near manufacturing uh, food processing plants, so they take some of their this waste. So it's free consumer, we use uh, processing food scraps, if you will. Um, and they they play a big role and they use it on site. So, but I I do not think there's a lot of farmers in Ohio that are land applying sewer sludge. Um, now there's some areas that um, they have, I know some wastewater treatment plants, they also have um, land where they do apply um, some of their treated sewer sludge. Uh, but I don't think, I don't know if it's going to farmlands in now in large amounts. Okay, fair. Uh, Teresa, any thoughts on either of those questions? Yeah, um, the way our regulations are with that, that two ton per week limit, that really it doesn't make it worth it for farmers to take um, food waste. Um, so no, there really aren't farmers that are that are composting food waste. Um, as far as um, I also do the industrial sludge land application program, and so there there is a lot of industrial sludge that gets land applied in Iowa. Um, so I don't, I guess I don't really see that as that compo of compost replacing that. Um, have had some interest in people wanting to like combine uh, some industrial sludge with compost and then land apply it and um, or different manure and, and industrial sludge and stuff like that. Um, it gets a little tricky when you you got regulations with one program and now you've got two programs and so that gets a little tricky. But um, but yeah, they um, yeah I, I I guess I don't really see it as as replacing uh, replacing uh, industrial sludge. Okay, <clears throat> Sean, any thoughts from your end? So uh, the question is, uh, to what extent can farms play a role in food waste reduction? Is that what mm -hmm. it, food waste composting? Um, so. Uh, what I tell folks is that um, composting leaf and yard waste is kind of the the um, from a resource standpoint, it's it's kind of like the high school level. Composting um, vegetable culls is the college level. When you get into post-consumer food waste, it's graduate studies, and you have to know what you're doing and be have the time and the carbon and the resources. Um, in Massachusetts, our our composters are allowed to bring in 75 tons per week of high nitrogen material, which would include food waste. Um, that that would take a lot of a lot of management on that. We only have one or two. Um, I've seen I've seen composting, especially of post-consumer food waste, um, give good farms a bad name, bad reputation. Um, so to the to the extent that that it can be mutually beneficial, that they have the time to devote to it and it can help their farm. Um, I think it can play a role, but I don't know if it would play a huge role um, as solid waste processors, uh, at least not the, maybe not the MDOT ones. Um, they certainly play a role. And I think, I, I don't know how much, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me about how much food waste um, was disposed of. They have to file an annual report. Um, it, and there is quite a bit, I don't know, maybe 100,000 pounds. I don't have it in front of me. Um, sure. As far as composting biosolids goes, um, it, it, if you're composting biosolids, you're not in the MDAR program. Clearly, there's, there's uh, biosolids and sludge being applied nationwide to farmland, right? Um, that doesn't fall under our MDAR program. Okay, I mean, I think your perspective uh, from Massachusetts is particularly interesting just because of the the ban on disposal of organics. It's been in Food place for yeah. yeah, and, and it um, actually just got more stringent. It just went down to a half a ton a week. Uh, so farms certainly do play a role, um, but I don't know if they play the major role. I think probably the, the DEP sites play the major role of it. Uh, but with that said, food waste can go to animal feed as well. And when you look at the hierarchy um, at the pyramid, that's above composting, human food, animal food, composting, and landfill. Um, so, 
Thank you. And I have a follow-up question for you, Sean, but I'll come back to you. Yeah. Derek. Sure. Yeah, I think in order to promote food scrap composting, whether it's a farmland or non-farmland, we need to figure out how we're going to solve the problems associated with the design and the uh, operational problem with the food scrap type operations. They have an order issue, they have an issue with the leachate, they have an issue with the contamination. <clears throat> so unless we're going to solve those, I don't think that we can promote the food scrap type operation state. But farmers can definitely play a vital role, especially in Maryland, uh, they are exempted. So they can just uh, apply for a general permit. And if they plan to bring food scrap large quantities from outside the farm, which they don't own and operate, then uh, we can work with them to uh, get them a permit and they can definitely start uh, promoting their business and stuff. And there is always a 5,000 square feet limit uh, exempt, exemption available, which they can use to at least try out things because under 5,000 square foot, they can bring material from outside the farm, which are whatever material is acceptable in the regulations. So yeah, this way they can look into this. Plus, uh, but I think still the technical problems with this food scrap composting operation is a major barrier for this promotion. I've seen businesses, they talk about it, they want to start, but then they stop even though they are operating, but they can't move forward from that point because it's a problem. Okay, and any thoughts on sludge? I'm not sure. Sludge is not regulated under our composting regulations. We have a separate program who issues sludge composting related permits and stuff. I guess, do you see uh, on-farm composting replacing sludge application or need the de demand for sludge in Maryland? I can't talk about it. I don't know the numbers then, you know. Okay. You know. Fair. Okay. So a follow-up question on contamination, and I think this was directed at you, Sean, um, wondering if for the farms that might be taking food scraps and composting them, um, has the commingling of of the separate the source separated food scraps and packaged food impacted like the willingness for farmers to take that material? Uh, so not so much on the farms. Um, I can recall one issue when when um, non-compostable plastics were uh, in post-consumer food waste, and it was an issue. Um, not so much anymore. I know there's at least one DEP site that has a depackager. Um, they got a grant for a depackager. Um, usually, the the food waste uh, composters aren't that aren't that big that they would need such equipment. Uh, at least the, the on farm. Um, so I, I'm not familiar with uh, physical contaminants, um, plastics, that sort of thing, being a huge issue. Okay, that thank, you. thank you for that. Okay, so uh, another question for everyone, because um, I may follow up with you all for individual questions um, from participants. Uh, what are the testing costs for when, uh, I guess, when the compost has to be tested, um, which I'm assuming is more on the compost use end of things, uh, and what are the tests required? On how? Yep, I can go. Um, our testing requirements in Ohio are similar to what is used by uh, required for sludge. Also, it's um, pretty much very similar to what is required by the U.S. Composting Council Seal of Testing Assurance Program. Um, so anyone that participates in that program automatically meets our requirements. So we require for heavy metals, we require for pathogens like E. coli and salmonella. Um, then we require for sorting matter and then MPK, organic content, pH, and some uh, requirements that are most for, for determining the use. A whole set of that I have seen in Ohio be between it's about 300 to so have seen almost some lab charging almost to 700 for the same test. I'm not sure why the big difference. Um, however, we allow facilities to consolidate finished compost up to 10,000 cubic yards before taking the sampling. Uh, so most of our larger facilities, because it's seasonal, they produce um, compost during 
the, the late spring, summer, fall, usually start accepting, and then they're gonna sell in the spring. So they then they uh, divide and and test in the spring. So some of our largest facilities. Maybe the most they do is like four samplings a year because they consolidate everything they have been doing, then mix and then sample from a larger volume. So it doesn't have to be per pile or per window. But in Ohio, everything has to be tested before this year. So it's not like a frequency or every so often or great volume is everything you produce. You have to test, but you can accumulate to have a to sample from a larger amount and reduce the cost. Great, thank you. Teresa, what about Iowa? Um, yeah, it would be very similar to what he said as far as um, what they have to test for. Um, and that would be our permitted facilities that 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 in, in our requirements that we have. Um, what that costs, I don't I don't really have any idea. Um, and then um, um the soil conditioners requirements um I, I i can't i can't speak to that either so sorry <laughs> no all right, all good thank you sean any insight so, from your end so in massachusetts we don't require testing of the uh, um of the compost necessarily um i i recommend if, if folks don't know the materials they get a compost profile of the inputs um we do have testing requirements for application nutrient management um so prior to apply land applying um the farms are supposed to test the soil determine what its uh needs are and then test the compost and and apply it accordingly um that's the extent of our testing requirements we do have if compost is going to be sold um, and they make nutrient claims that that has to be tested mm -hmm. um, but aside from that we don't have mandatory testing okay Derek, last answer here in Maryland, uh, Department of Ag, they register the compost products. So I would assume that they probably know what the testing procedures are and stuff. And But MD, Department of the Environment, does not do testing and stuff. Right. OK, so a question more for uh, Departments of Ag um, in this scenario. So um, thank you all um, for staying over a couple of minutes. I do have specific questions for for some of you from from the participants, which I will just email you um, afterwards. But thank you all for taking time and for taking on the challenge of trying to fit so much into a short period of time. Um, and thank you all participants for staying with us and asking your questions. Have a great rest of the day. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you everyone. Thank you.